Amen. Thank you for joining me today. We are looking at a topic that's so important. It's been on my heart, my mind, goodness, for a long time. And it just hadn't been the quite the right time to preach it until today. And I thank God he's given me the opportunity to preach today. And I pray God that it'll help and bless you in a serious way, because we talk a lot uh, uh, here about sin and about holiness and about God and about righteousness. And yet oftentimes, you know, naturally we look within, amen. But if we're looking at the consequences of sin, I want you to imagine a boat in the lake. And when you have a boat in the lake or the ocean, as it goes along its way, and you look behind the boat, there's that wake, that water, that rough water that kind of just spiders out. And if you've ever spent time, say like at a lake, because the water is very flat usually, you know, not like a great lake. I know that they get a lot of winds and stuff, but just like a little lake. If you spend time at a lake and a boat passes by and you're on the shore of the lake, even if that boat is far away, that wake still still gets you and it still gets you pretty good. I mean, the, the waters get quite rough and you can tell a boat has passed by. I mean, you can physically see it, of course, but even if you can't see it, it's amazing how the movement of one can affect another and the movement of one that affects another, uh, it's not the other's choice. I think of like when the kids were little and we let them play at the shore of the lake. I mean, we go to uh, all kinds of lakes. North Carolina has got a million lakes. <clears throat> we go to uh, lakes up there in Asheville, uh, in South Carolina, the upstate especially. Uh, and the kids will be playing in the shore. And the kids, uh, you know, they like the calm water, especially when they were little, very little. Uh, and a boat would pass by and, you know, the kids are getting splashed and stuff. And sometimes they get a little scared. They didn't know what was going on. You know, they didn't choose for that to happen. And there's such a destructive wake that comes from sin. You know, there, there's things that happen to others when you or when I or when anybody individually sins. And this is personal to me. I've seen the destructive wake of sin up close and personal. You know, I've seen it in my life in many ways. I saw it at a time when I was so young, I, I didn't understand what it was, but I knew how destructive it had been. And the world is sin sick. You know, sin entered the picture in the Garden of Eden and was brought about by the father of lies, the devil. And here it is, thousands of years later, it's as rampant as ever. Romans 5.12 tells us, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so we see here, that you have sin and death. These things are inter interchanged, and we'll get to our text verse in a minute. But they're part, uh, they go together, sin and death. It happened when Adam sinned. Yes, Eve ate of the fir fruit first, but Adam's the head of the house, and he's responsible. Amen. And that's just one example of how sin can have consequences on other people. But he also sinned too. He ate of the fruit and so forth. It enters by Adam. It has been here ever since. No person on earth save the Lord Jesus Christ, no person that ever lived has lived sinless. Sin comes naturally to us. You know, we, you think, oh, well, how can that, how do you know that? You look at little kids. They naturally are sinful. Amen. Sweet, wonderful kids will lie to your face, will commit, you know, ridiculous acts, will do all kinds of things, will steal, you know, on and on. Sin entered the world with Adam, sin has been here, and today we're really going to focus on the, the how our sin affects others. But what is sin? Let's start there. And the way I describe sin, and I, this is just literally the preacher in me, I just describe it, anything that goes against the holy ways of God. Anything that goes against the holy ways of God, that's not enough for you. I want to give you scripture here. 1 John 3, 4, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So what is sin? It's the transgression of the law. What is the law? Those are God's ways, right? You know, thou shall not lie. You lie, that's a sin. 
Thou shall not covet. You covet, that's a sin. You know, thou shall not commit adultery. You commit adultery, that's a sin, right? Uh, thou shall not have any idols or any other gods but me. Those are sins. The idea of committing a sin, the Bible tells us, <clears throat> is a process in which we do something bad, right? We have a lust, we're enticed, we give into that sin, that lust is conceived, and then we reap the consequences of that sin, which is death. But the idea of committing sin is like sowing and reaping, like what you plant is what crop you'll look to get. If I were a gardener, and anyone that knows me knows I'm a terrible gardener, I, uh, but we try, okay? If I go in my backyard and I put some corn down, and I'm waiting for that corn to come up and those ears of corn to grow up, and all of a sudden, I put corn down, all of a sudden, uh, you know, um, tomatoes are blossoming, rooting up there. I would say that's crazy, right? But yet people live in sin and they expect not to reap what they sow. They live in sin and they want to reap peace, you know? They live violently and they want to reap uh, happiness and love and peace and affection. These, it's incredible how man lives because God gives us this simple example of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, capital S, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And you could say the flesh being like our sinful nature, right? So if you're sowing or you're planting to those fleshful, fleshly desires, the sinful nature, the I, the me, right? What you want, uh, putting God out of it, expect to reap that. Expect to reap the wages of that. And if you sow to the spirit everlasting, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, if you're sowing those kind of seeds, if you are reining yourself in, Paul writes about getting his body under subjection, amen, the idea of bringing every thought before Christ, if we were living for God the best we can, not perfectly, but the best we can, okay? That means that we're not hiding from God, amen? That we're repenting before God when we mess up and we're trying our very best not to do that again, that we're not prideful, that we're living for God, then we will reap life everlasting. We'll reap the spirit. You, you reap what you sow. That's the old saying. And biblically here, that the other idea or um, kind of undercurring theme is vanity, right? And so in the, we think of vanity as like a vain person that, you know, going to, you know, uh, looking, trying to look their best out on the outside or something and get everyone to look at them. But vanity in the Bible it more means improper use, living against the ways of God. God made you to bring him glory, to serve him, to win souls, to be fruitful. Of course, first and foremost, to be born again. He made you in that light. And you're over here rebelling and living sinful and living against his ways and blaspheming him and living, you know, in just total sin. The idea is vanity. You're living vainly, improperly, right? You're living against the ways of God. And you can see in the Old Testament, scattered throughout, there'll be times where people are living so wickedly and so sinful that God will judge them as a way to show his displeasure with sin, his holiness. He doesn't judge every sinner in the Old Testament right away. The judgment comes, uh, as we read in the Bible, uh, at, at death, basically, okay? And that is not even yet. So we die, and then you have the judgment, which, as I understand it, uh, is after the rapture, after uh, the, 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 the um, uh, first death, you have what's called the second death, where if you're unsaved, you have the white throne judgment, where God brings before you your sin and says, how are you going to pay for it? And of course, you can't claim Jesus at that point because you had a chance, you had a witness, you had someone that told you about the Lord and you rejected him. And that's when you have to pay the ultimate price. That's called the second death, which is a real literal hell. Hell is a real place. It's in the Bible, as I understand it, more. it's written about more than heaven, amen? So you have vanity, improper use, living against the ways of God. And all of this has consequences. Sin has consequences. Let me get to our text verse here. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 23 tells us that wages or payment for sin is death. It doesn't say the payment for some sin is death. The payment for sin that you can't explain is death. The payment for sin over here is death, but not over here. It says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you've been saved, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, 
as in Jesus paid that sin debt that you have on the cross at Calvary, you trust Jesus did that. You believe on him. That's called the atonement. You're saved. You're no longer under sin's curse. You're no longer going to be judged. At the white throne, you'll be what's called the Bema seat, which is just for rewards. God says, how do you plead? You say, I plead Jesus. He says, very well, uh, you're, you're into my heaven. Enjoy your reward. It's so simple, yet so many uh, won't make it because they don't believe, they have unbelief, and they, they, they don't want to get rid of their sin. And we see that sin is interesting in the Bible because we realize it's a transgression from God's ways, and it creates separation between us and God. And if, again, if you get in the Old Testament, you see God's chosen people, you see uh, they love God, they're doing well, then they fall into sin, they're worshiping idols, they're going astray, they're living away from the way God's commanded them to live. And what happens? Well, they're judged, and also they're separated from God. Isaiah 59, 2, but your iniquities, or sin, have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, my God doesn't change, amen? So Isaiah 59, 2 may be written to the Israelites, but it's totally applicable to the person here today that number one needs to be saved, and then number two, if you are saved and you're living in sin and you wonder why you don't have a close relationship with God, because sin separates us from God. So we realize the wages of sin is death. We realize that sin kills. We realize that sin separates us from God. We realize that sin is something that Jesus paid a dear price for on the cross. He gave his life so that we could be forgiven of that sin. So we have both the sin curse and the resolution, the reconciliation, amen, the atonement, the substitutionary death, which Christ performed on the cross at Calvary. It's already been done. So if we believe on Christ, we can be saved from sin. Now, what I want to focus on today is the idea that when we sin, whether saved or unsaved, there are grave consequences. Some people, it's not enough to hear that the wages of sin is death. It's not enough to hear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's not enough to hear or believe that Christ died for their sins. For some people, that's not enough to get them to seek a holy God. I mean, think about it. Some people are self-destructive, even reckless. You know, maybe the devil puts that spirit in them. God gives them over to reprobate mind and they're living out in the world. And they're like, yeah, you know, something bad could happen. That excites me. And and, and they may mean that being ignorant or willfully ignorant to the judgment to come because in the past, their sin hasn't really found them out yet. Well, that's not a anything to say for the future. (laughs) There is many, a wicked character in the Bible that God waited to the appropriate time to judge. Amen. I always think about that wicked king that came against Hezekiah. Hezekiah took the letter, he's blaspheming God. He took the letter and presented it before God, amen, at the altar. Said, God, look what they're saying about you. Look what this person is saying about you. And it was some years later, 10, 20, 30, 40 years later, I don't remember the exact date, that that wicked person that had talked, blasphemed God, was in the temple of his idol and was killed by his own children. Now, that is poetic, that is God's timing, and that wasn't immediate. So for those 30 or 40 years, you know, who knows what was going through that wicked king's mind, but hey, at the appropriate time, judgment fell hard, amen? It fell hard. And so what I want you to think about today is the repercussions of sin beyond yourself, because as that self-destructive person may not want to stop sinning themselves, Would they stop because of those they love? And I I wonder if that would compel some people to repent before God, to accept him as their Lord and Savior, to, to, to humble themselves before the mighty hand of God, that they don't think about what God may do to them, but they think about the repercussions that that sin has on those that they love. Now, we're going to look here in Joshua and we're going to look at the story of Achan. And this is a, there are so many examples in the Bible we could go with, but this is a simple one. And we see here in Joshua 6, verse 1, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given, to thee, uh, given into thee thine hand, Jericho, the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And so this is when Joshua and the Israelites are finally getting ready to, to take over Jericho, right? And God is telling them, I've given them to you. You're going to march around the city. You're going to blow these trumpets. It's all going to work great, right? 
Uh, and hey, I want you to destroy everybody in there except uh, Rahab the harlot. Uh, and and uh, here we have in verse 19, but all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord and they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So here's a God's command for the silver gold vessels of brass and iron. And so the people shouted with the trumpets that came to pass, the sound of the trumpet, you know, the walls fall flat. They utterly destroy the city. They save Rahab, the harlot. Uh, verse 27 of Joshua 6, things are looking good here. Uh, so the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Incredibly, they take over this city. They never thought they could and God gave them the victory. But here we have in Joshua 7, the very first verse. But the children of Israel committed a trespass. Remember, we read about sin being a trespass. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ahai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country, and men went up to view Ai. Now, what's going to happen here? Achan took of the accursed thing. He sinned. He trespassed against God. He went directly against the command of God. And now there's a, you know, they had, the Israelites are confident. They just overtaken Jericho. They go look at Ai, the small little place. They said, we don't need that men, you know, that many men up there. We'll just send a few thousand up there. <clears throat> well, they go up there and verse five says, and the men of Ai smote of them about 36 men for they chased them before the gate, even unto Sherebim and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted became as water. So they sent a small group up there confident. They had wiped those uh, people, those residents of AI out, and they don't. And then here we have verse six, Joshua saying, what's going on? Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening tide, he and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. They're repenting and they're going to God. And look what Joshua says in verse seven. And Joshua said, alas, O Lord, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us unto the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say then when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? So Joshua's wondering, what's going on? You know, God, how could we not have had this victory here? You know, and this is all of Israel, right? Collectively, they didn't have a victory. Even though they didn't send everybody up there, they didn't have a victory. And Presumably people died. And the, Lord, and the Lord sent unto Joshua, verse 10 here of Joshua chapter 7, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou, thou thus upon thy face? Israel, look at that, Israel, all God's people, hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. Remember, we don't want to transgress the law, that's sin. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. You see the cause and effect? The wages of sin is death. They violated God, right? Now, Achan, it doesn't say a bunch of people. One, one of them violated God. And they all suffered. But their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore. Here it is, except you destroy the accursed from among you. So now we have sin take place. We have the consequence of sin beyond just the individual that committed the sin. And now we have the repentance of the Israelites not knowing what was going on. And God says, here's how you clean up this mess. You get rid of it. You destroy that unclean thing. And so we go here and they, you know, they get up, they get all the tribes in front of them. They bring the different tribes in front of them. And we have verse uh, 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, give, I pray thee glory to God of Israel and make confession unto him. Uh, tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, I indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus I have done. So it's so interesting. We see in verse 20, Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. So Achan, in this, in this little bit of true history here in Joshua 7, tells us he was the one that sinned. Yet all of Israel suffered from this. And here was the reason why. When I saw, when I saw, that's coveting, by the way. When I saw among the spoils 
a goodly Babylonish, Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them and I took them and I behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers. And they ran under the tent and behold, it was hid in his tent and silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold. And here it is, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of this, the, that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. And that's verse 26 of Joshua 7. So it's interesting. One individual sins. You have a group or corporate consequence. Israel suffers. You have his family that also, I mean, it literally says sons and daughters are stoned and burned to death. Maybe they had nothing. Imagine one of his daughters, one of his sons had nothing to do with this. And now they're literally dying a brutal death because of the sin of their father. Sin affects more than you. Sin affects others. There is a terrible wake of sin that is evident when we live for the world and when we live for the flesh and we live in ways that we try to justify or rationalize or become philosophical or be willfully ignorant or however, whatever we try to do to wiggle our way out of living under God's rule and law. Okay. And again, we're not under his literal law, right? But we are, if you've been saved, born again, Christians, and we are to live, the Bible says, live holy as I am holy. Amen. Amen. We are to do our best to live God, you know, as God called us to live, especially those that know how to, you know, what we're supposed to do. And that's why God gives us a conscience to know wrong and right. Surely Achan, when he saw that gold and silver, he knew better. He knew God's command. He knew not to touch it and to give it over to the temple and so forth, but he didn't. He sinned. And not only did he die, but his family died. And so what I want you to understand here today is that in the Bible, there are clear, this is not the only example. There's many examples, amen. Um, Gideon, we always talk about Gideon, you know, Gideon in the 300 and all so forth, doing, doing great, uh, mighty things for the Lord, amen, and rescuing uh, Israel in the book of Judges. You know, he collected some gold at the end of his uh, battles, built himself an idol, and, you know, just a few verses later, you learn that he had a whole bunch of kids and pretty much all but Two of them died and they were murdered, all but two of them. You know, that's not good. That's, again, sin is carrying on. We see the effects of sin can reach generations. Now, I want to clarify. If you, uh, let's see, let's say you're a son and your mom's a, like just sinner, rebellious and so forth. And God's not going to hold their sin over your head. The Bible, I think it's in the book of Ezekiel, says the the dad's a, you know, or mom or whoever parent that it's their sin is their sin. And the daughter, the son, their sin is their sin. So if you are someone that is like under a parent that's living sinful, it doesn't mean that God's going to hold you accountable for that. And I've heard this said too, especially you get like kids that are becoming adults, you know, young adults, you get wayward children. The parent isn't held accountable for that. That person's of the age of accountability. They're not held accountable so let's, <clears throat> let's, let's kind of divide that from this, this point that I'm going to make here, because it's important to understand that while we are each responsible for our own conduct, especially as adults, the effects of sin can reach generations. Again, that wake is going to reach generations, even if they're not judged by it or held accountable for it, they still have to deal with it. Exodus 34, 7. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression, transgression and sin, and that will be, be that will by no means clear the guilty, 
visiting the iniquity, that sin, of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and to the fourth generation. Okay? So you see the parallel? We serve God, we depart from sin, we receive his mercy forgiveness, right? He keeps mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin. He's a forgiving God. That's, that's I believe, God's chosen path for man to forgive him or her, right? But as we live in sin, thinking we get away with it, we, re- we don't realize our sin has repercussions. And this isn't a point I need to make in theory or philosophy or theology or something. This is something you can see. You ever know someone that's living in sin? You ever see how their kids are living? You know, you think about the bus ministry, you go knocking on some doors and stuff. You have parents that are drinking alcohol at nine, 10 o'clock in the morning, and you'll see the kids sitting there. Now tell me those kids aren't suffering from what those parents are doing. Now let's just say the parents get evicted. Is that fun for the kids? Let's say one of the parents overdoses and dies. Is, is that going to be helpful for the child? You know, is that going to bless them? No. You, you know, what if they go to jail and so forth? What if they don't go to jail and then they get their kids hooked on drugs or alcohol and their kids suffer from it? So if you're a sinner with kids, your kids deal with the wake of your sin. And imagine their kids dealing with the wake of your sin. And then their kids experience on and on. It's like a cycle. I don't, you know, if preachers start talking about all their family stuff or this or that. And I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> so I'm not going to go too deep into this, but on my mother's side, my grandfather was an alcoholic. I think that was just fact. Okay. And he was abusive physically and mentally and all this. So that fractured that family so much so that whether it was going to be or not, my mother developed a very serious mental illness. She ends up getting a divorce. So I see divorce on the grandparent side. I see uh, all the problems that had trickled down from the addiction and the alcoholism. Then I see it with my mom. Then I see it. I'm the wildest kid in the school, completely out of control, getting in trouble all the time. Well, imagine that. And I literally would sit there. I remember we had this old bunk bed that we inherited from my uncle had like, right, it was like an old wood bunk bed. And I would just stare at those grains of wood and there was old writing on there and stickers and stuff. And I would think it was, I would think to myself, cause I was like 10, 12, 13, 14. I was like, it's almost like we're under some kind of curse, you know, because of the way things had shook out, you know, the way things went. Because as I got older, I realized not everyone's parents were divorced or grandparents were divorced or dealt with his alcoholism and abuse and mental illness and poverty and uh, you know, all manipulations and problems galore. And so I realized that, that the wake of that sin from, say, the grandfather, who I barely knew, I think I met him twice, the wake of the sin from him onto the parents, onto me, and by God's mercy and grace, he saved me and got me out of that mess around 30, Okay. And it, it is by God's grace because I was on the same exact path in all the same mess. Okay. The people were surprised. I got married at 33. They're like, that's late, especially in the South. <laughs> people get married young here. Hey, well, you're going to get married a little bit later when all you've seen is divorce and broken homes and heartache and you've experienced it. You know, you've experienced it. You've, you've been that kid that doesn't have a ride home from school or doesn't have a parent at the, at the football game or whatever it is. And, You've seen kids with a regular household and you know the difference. And again, I didn't, I didn't give the alcohol to grandpa, right? On and on. Now, again, a perfect example from Ezekiel. I'm, I'm not judged upon his sin. God has been merciful. He's forgiven me. And now we see a fruitful process where our kids are growing up, preacher's kids, growing up in church and, uh, you know, VBS or whatever it is, Sunday school and good things and Proverbs time and Bible lessons and homeschool. And they, they see their parents all day, every day. They're with their parents pretty much. And you're seeing, a, so you saw the destructive side of sin. You see the fruit of turning to God. In fact, you know, I'm just, of all the things I'm thankful to, to the Lord for, and there are many besides my salvation, it's, it's keeping the family together. Amen. Because I saw the wake of that sin, right? It reaches generations. So we're each accountable for our own, but it's a very serious thing. And, and, and I think that kids, young folks, 
especially, I believe that the devil's tool of social media specifically is numbing kids to the idea that sin has consequences. Adults too, but certainly impressionable young people. So what are some modern day examples of sin? Again, I went over the drunk, you know, and you can see that. The compulsive gambler, you can see how that would shake out. You know, not just the drunk dad, by the way. I had a, a stepmom that was dealing with alcoholism and all kinds of things. It's not good. Not good on either side. How about the adulterer? You know, you see that. You see like politicians and stuff. You see them in the news and you see their little kids. I mean, how crushing must it be? Uh, you know, and, and not just for them, but I'm just saying like as a picture, it's so sad. The fornicator going against God's will and his ways. The thief, amen. The murderer, you know, someone commits murder, they're in jail their whole life, you know. The coveter, you know, imagine growing up in that environment, you know. Imagine being a holy Christian woman and being married to someone that's never satisfied with what he has and won't hear the word of God and is always just simply coveting other things. You know, your coveting is not only hurting you because you're unsatisfied and you're not living as God wants you to live. Again, you're living in vanity or vain and proper use. It's hurting your wife. It's hurting your kids, it's hurting your family. How about the unbelieving idolater? Talk about that. Amen. You know, the wake of sin there, you know, you're living for idols. That's what the oftentimes was the biggest um, qualm God had with the Israelites was their idolatry. The abject idolatry. And you say, well, we don't, we don't have a lot of idols. Yes, we do. Anything you put above God is an idol. And so, again, you don't think the kids see that, the brother, the sister, the mom, the grandma, the dad, whoever, the friend, the coworker. We're all very impressionable. I mean, I look at myself like, oh, I'm a pretty independent person. Look, if I was going to the walking track, right? I go to the walking track, go walking. If somebody there was there, five days in a row and they had a water bottle. And every day I looked at that water bottle and said, that's a pretty cool water bottle. By the fifth day, I'd probably be like, okay, how do I get this water bottle? That person's got a good water bottle. We are all like that. We all are impressionable. So when you have sin in your life, even again, or especially the sin of idolatry, it will oppress upon others. Amen. You know, the blasphemer, God help us, you know, God help us. People don't even know they're doing it. Amen. I saw a young person the other day. They didn't even know they were doing it. The gossiper, that's a sin, by the way. You know, and, and how many people are you affecting with that? The brawler, you know, our sin affects others. It, the wake of sin is real and it has serious, dire consequences. And you say, but the world thinks it's okay. It's everywhere. Let me tell you about the world. Proverbs 14, 12. I love this verse so much. I think about it all the time. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That sums up the world right there. There is a way which seemeth right unto man. It seems right to man to put nudity in a movie or, por or pornography or put blaspheme or put curse words or bad influence. It seems right to man to do that, right? It seems right to man to cheat or to lie, to steal, to get ahead. It seems right to man to judge someone on their outside appearance. It seems right to man to rank society by who has money like that. Like that is any indication of morality or, or true worth, right? These things seem right to man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, which again, the wages of sin is death. The end thereof is the ways of sin. Sin's not funny. It's not cute. Sin to a holy God is an abomination. Amen. It's an abomination. You're to turn from your sin, not just for your sake, but for the sakes of those you love now and the sakes of those that you love in the future. If I care about my kids, 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 I'm going to try to live right today. Amen. You know, there's a preacher I really like, and I don't want to embarrass him, but there's a preacher I like, and he's older up in age. And uh, every time I get to go to his church, uh, you know, campus, really, he's got a lot going on over there. I think what a godly heritage. And I don't even know if he's got kids, how old his kids are, or his grandkids, but what a godly heritage that that preacher has left for generations to come. 
because he chose to live for God the very best he could. Not perfect, but the very best he could. He lived for God. He forsake the things of the world. He followed God. He followed the Lord. And the Lord turned around and blessed him, not with the material things of the world, but with a godly heritage that his kids, kids, kids can say, yeah, yep, that's that's the same name. Yeah, we're, it's the same. Yeah, we're from that family line. Yeah, Lord's really blessed us. Lord's been good to us. Amen. Oh, how good God is. You know, God's paying attention to the details. If you haven't thought about that here today, and I'm about to wrap up, God, God's paying attention to the details. He's paying attention to the little things. You know, he's paying attention to what we're browsing online or on our phones, what apps we're downloading. He's paying attention to what we're saying to one another. He's paying attention to what we're doing with our free time. He's paying attention to our, our devotions and, our, and our, our passions. He's paying attention. And by the way, and I'm going to end with this, if you feel like you have sin in your life and now you thought about it a little more deeply, trust God to forgive you of that sin. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, it starts with accepting Christ as Savior. And then the Bible says we don't need a mediator. We don't have to confess confess to someone else. We confess straightly to God. The Bible says that when Christ died on the cross at Calvary, that the veil was torn in two, rent in two. The curtain that covered the most holy of holies was torn in two. Because now, since Christ died for our sins, we have direct access to God. In fact, the Bible tells us to come to the throne room boldly, amen, that we are to cast all our cares upon him for he careth for us. So we are to confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We get saved, we trust Christ, just give it to God. And here it is the way that I've learned about repentance. Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for hearing my sins. Thank you for what Christ did for me on the cross. Lord, I have done this sin, whatever it may be, or I don't know what sin I've done, but I I just, maybe I have, Lord, could you help the Holy Spirit reveal it to me? And then once you understand the sin, you say, Lord, I identify that sin with something that's an abomination to you. And I agree with you. I don't want any part of it. Please, Lord, help me to never do that again. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That's, that's how you repent. Amen. You identify that sin as an abomination to God and to you. You, you get on God's side of the issue and say, you're holy. I'm supposed to be holy. You don't like lying. I don't like lying. We're not, I'm not going to do it. I identify with it and I'm not going to do it. That is repentance. It's not perfection. Amen. It's not perfection. I could go on, but I believe my time has come to an end here for today. Lots to think about. The point I want you to remember is that sin has consequences beyond ourselves. And while we're each accountable for our own sins, we have to really be mindful of those around us and realize, especially I keep mentioning the family unit, but realize that our sin can affect even our family. The sin of a child can affect the parents. The sin of the parents can affect the children on and on. We must live for the Lord. He's been too good to us. Guess what he did? He died for our sins so that we could live for him. Let's not mess that up. Let us accept his sweet gift of salvation, which we're simply justified by faith. We simply believe we're saved. Now let's turn from our sin. Let's earnestly repent and let's live for him and tell others, show others. Next time you see someone making light of sin, saying sin is no joke. It has serious consequences. Thank you for tuning in. Take care. God bless and amen.